Okay, welcome everybody to the next IAQM webinar, Environmental Bill, a new framework for environmental guidance. So today we're going to hear from two speakers, Martin Baxter, IEMA's Chief Policy Advisor, and Katie Neild, who is a clean air lawyer at Client Earth. So Martin has extensive experience of environmental policy, working with senior parliamentarians, government officials, business leaders and academia, and he is currently chair of the International Organisation for Standardisation, ISO Subcommittee on Environmental Management Systems and head of the UK delegation. Katie's work focuses on UK clean air issues and promoting compliance with domestic and international air quality standards. Since 2011, Client Earth has launched three successful legal challenges against the UK government's failure to commit to action to reduce pollution to within legal le limits. Before joining Client Earth, Katie practiced as a planning and environmental lawyer at international law firm Berwyn Leighton Paisner. So after each presentation, Christine McHugh, the current chair of IAQM, will take your questions and host the discussion with both speakers. So please do submit your questions in the Q&A option at the bottom of your screen at any point during either of the presentations. If your question is for one speaker in particular, please put their initials at the beginning of your question and Christine will ask these on your behalf. So thank you all for logging in and I'm now gonna hand over to Martin. Okay, uh, well, firstly, thank you very much for the introduction. Hello, everybody. Um, it's great to be able to present on the Environment Bill. Um, I've titled this a new governance framework because I think, you know, as the UK has now left the EU, we're working through the transition period. Um, 30 years of EU policymaking is being replaced by um, a framework within which we will be setting our own environmental policy and, and legislation going forward. Um, so it's, it's interesting times from that perspective. Um, it's also interesting given um, both the long-term degradation of the environment and the extent to which um, we can build a more positive uh, future where natural capital and natural assets can be en enhanced over a period of time. I think from our perspective, that's the work that we've been um, engaging over the last few years in um, providing in input into the development of this bill, both with policymakers um, across government, so um, DEFRA, MHCLG, um, Number 10, and Treasury in particular, doing a lot of work there, and then also um, providing uh, evidence into also the select committee inquiries, both at the pre-legislative scrutiny stage and most recently in the committee bill stage um, a couple of months ago, just before lockdown. Um, as I say, I've titled this a new environmental governance framework because I think there are some key elements in the bill as it currently is, which uh, provide some interesting opportunities for um, setting a new direction for how we might manage the environment going forward. And hopefully, um, you know, we'll be able to, to, to highlight those in this session and then perhaps have some discussion afterwards about the extent to which they may or may not be effective. Um, and what more might be needed to deliver a more progressive environmental agenda going forward. Just as a recap, the bill was first published in its entirety on the 5th of, 15th of October uh, last year. Um, it fell when, we, when the election was announced, so it had got to second reading, but fell. It was reintroduced um, as an updated version on the 13th of January uh, earlier this year. Um, it's worth noting that there were some, uh, some, some changes to some parts of the bill, not, not hugely, but, but, but potentially quite importantly, um, between um, October and January's reintroduction. Um, it's published in eight parts, 19 schedules, 244 pages. It's a really significant bill, um, not just because it's the first one for a long time that deals uh, and focuses on the environment as a whole, but just given the, the number of policy announcements within it uh, and provisions um, does make it, uh, you know, uh, quite, quite a, a challenge to get through to, to understand how all parts, particularly in the governance section, work together and then how they link to some of the topic aspects as well. And, and I think it's fair to say, given the nature of the bill, um, it will potentially have some far reaching effects going forward and I'll outline where they might be um, in the next few slides. Um, 
The bill has been making its passage through Parliament. It did get to committee bill stage in March. That was paused because of um, Parliament effectively shutting down for most business. Um, and the report stage from the bill committee has been set back by a month. So we're expecting um, the report stage at the end of July, I think. Um, but but we're not entirely sure what the timetable will for getting the bill on the statute. I'll pick up on some of the timescale aspects um, a little bit later. So just to give some insight into what the key elements from the governance perspective are, um, and I'll, I'll dive into a bit more on the process for setting legally binding targets. But the first chapter, uh, the first part of the bill um, has a process for setting uh, long term legally binding targets. Um, there's a section on environmental improvement plans. This very much is based around um, putting the 25 year environment plan onto a statutory basis, but then wrapped around that is, for example, the target setting process. Um, some issues around interim targets, um, issues around environmental monitoring, which is a new section in the bill on that. Um, so there's a little bit more to just putting the 25 year plan on a statutory footing. Um, and it's, you know, the, the plan, the DEFRA's plan will need to be updated quite significantly um, to accommodate, you know, its positioning as a, as a legal document in that regard uh, going forward. So there is a section on environmental monitoring. Uh, environmental principles are really important. Um, so uh, the Treaty on the Functioning of the EU, um, Article 191, um, establishes some core environmental principles on uh, and which form the basis of environmental policy making in the EU. So things like the precautionary principle, polluter pays, um, the prevention of pollution, etc. So those principles are hardwired into uh, the constitution on how the EU functions um, and apply in the context of environmental policy making. In this bill, there is provision for a policy statement on environmental principles. Um, the principles are named on the bill, but they're not defined in the bill. They'll be defined in that policy statement um, going forward. But that policy statement will um, be something that ministers of the Crown will have to have uh, due regard to as they come forward with policies. I think the interesting thing there is that that policy statement extends beyond uh, just environmental policy making, but bites on pretty much all areas of policy making. So whether it's MHCRG, whether it's Department for Education, whether it's the Department for Transport, uh, ministers there will be bound by this policy statement on environmental principles. Um, so that's gonna be really, I think, very important. If we are, you know, as many of us as environmentalists recognise that environment needs to be integrated into all forms of decision making and that go, needs to then translate across government. Um, there are a couple of carve outs. So one is that the Treasury is, um, and defence matters have been uh, carved out of the application of these principles. It'll be interesting to see how, you know, during the rest of passage of the bill, um, the extent to which that stays in probably will do, given the government's majority. Um, but nevertheless, I think that is the way in which the principal sections come forward um, could be really important in the context of broad government policy making. Uh, there was the, one of the new additions in the bill was um, statements around um, non-regression um, and also environmental improvements or improvement statements. Uh, so this was added between um, the October 2019 version of the bill and the one that was published um, at the beginning of this year. In effect, in terms of non-regression, it doesn't preclude the government from lowering standards, but it does require any legislative provision to have a statement to the effect that um, there will be no diminution in environmental standards um, by the introduction of a particular environmental piece of legislation, or that um, they will have to give reasons why they cannot make that statement. So that's quite an interesting area where there will be effectively a statement of compatibility with non-regression uh, going forward. Also, on a two yearly basis, there will be um, statements to Parliament and reports to Parliament looking at um, 
best practice in environmental legislation around the world um, and, and internationally. So whether that's um, from individual countries um, or groupings such as the EU or in international fora. Um, and then, you know, government will be determining the extent to which the UK should follow that particular line, either directly through legislative provisions or by enhancing, um, you know, either targets in the bill or um, some of the measures that they have in environmental improvement plans. So that is an interesting area. Um, it's probably no surprise that that's been added in the context of the UK's negotiations with the EU. Um, and all the questions around level playing field provisions, which are under active discussion and debate between the negotiating teams at the moment. The other really important area in terms of um, governance uh, elements in, in, in this whole framework is the new uh, Office for Environmental Protection. Um, so this body has um, a number of uh, powers and duties. And one is, um, in terms of the ability to offer advice on legislative change. Um, that would include this area for le setting legally binding targets. Um, and for example, this non-regression statements um, that, that would come through. But crucially also has the, um, the powers to enforce public authorities um, implementation of environmental law with an escalating set of um, enforcement actions that it can take from uh, no decision notices um, right through to being able to take uh, action in the upper tier tribunal. So again, an important plank there, in effect, it's been established to provide um, a similar role to that played by the European Commission in ensuring that member states comply with the implementation of directives and regulations. So those are kind of the main planks of the governance framework. It's also just worth mentioning that there are topic specific chapters on air quality, water, uh, nature and biodiversity and resource efficiency and waste. So that includes you know, major initiatives such as biodiversity net gain, extended producer responsibility, deposit return schemes. There are a whole series of very important um, topic specific uh, legislative provisions and this bill will bring forward a significant number of new individual regulations to enact all of this whole process. Just showing um, a little bit more detail around uh, in particular this uh, process for setting uh, legally binding targets. So um, the first clause in the bill um, establishes this in terms of um, and, and government is looking at this in terms of um, a long-term target is one which is 15 years into the future. So that's what this first part of the bill does. It sets uh, the basis on which there will be long-term targets established in uh, four key areas. So one will be in air quality. So there will be a new long-term air quality target, a water target, a biodiversity target, and a resource efficiency and waste reduction target. So the, the sector of state has a duty to set those, um, or at least one in each area by the end of October 2022. Um, there's also a separate duty to set a PM 2.5 ambient air quality target by the 31st of October 22 as well. That can be a long-term target, but it doesn't have to be. Um, and so that target could be um, on a shorter timetable there's been quite a lot of pressure during committee bill stage for government to set that target on the face of the bill. So rather than set a process by which they will um, set both the PM 2.5 um, target and the date by which that target has to be achieved, um, the question is whether they will um, uh, bow to the uh, pressure from the, the committee um, in terms of discussions and, and, and put that target on the face of the bill. Um, targets must specify what standard is to be achieved um, and it must be capable of being objectively measured and the date by which it has to be achieved. Um, there's a requirement for the Secretary of State to seek independence and expert advice when they're setting targets and there is some work underway within government to set up um, a process for dealing with that. 
Um, the Secretary of State has a duty to meet targets um, and interim targets, effectively milestones are set through environmental improvement plans. I think it's fair to say that a lot of discussion and debate has been around, um, you know, it's one thing to have a duty to meet the targets, but if you set a target 15 years into the future and you set them in 2022, arguably the Secretary of State only has to ensure that they comply with that target well, um, by 2037, which is a long time into the future. And therefore the question is, how can we ensure that that process of improvement and the trajectory to ensure that we do actually achieve and exceed targets um, within timeframes which are set, um, that the mechanisms for delivering that are in place and that people can be held to account for that. So that's where um, quite a lot of discussion and debate have been um, in terms of trying to strengthen provisions and, and close any potential gaps. So some of the key issues that arise from this, I mean, the, the, governance, pro, the governance part of the bill um, is big on process and ensuring that all of these key elements work together as an integrated and combined system is going to be really important. So that process of firstly um, setting targets um, for the long term, embedding those in plans and actually developing plans which are going to be um, robust in terms of ensuring that those targets are delivered, establishing the milestones, so what's the pace at which we need to be moving forward to achieve those targets, um, monitoring our performance and our ability uh, 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 and you know on an annual basis or regular basis, reporting to Parliament, so actually having scrutiny, reviewing whether we're actually on the right trajectory or not and making adjustments etc that whole process of work, work really, really well. And there are important uh, roles in there, both you know, the Secretary of State, but also the OEP in providing some um, reporting into this and also the role of Parliament as well. So that whole process has to be um, really well oiled um, in, in order to get the right rhythm right and actually to drive the right action. And it's driving action, which is absolutely critical. Um, you know, that does bring for these questions of accountability and how can we hold um, government to account on an ongoing basis for not just achieving, being in a position to achieve those long-term targets, but actually maintaining the pace of, uh, uh, and that trajectory towards achievement. Thirdly, there's this important bit is about, it's one thing to have a framework for setting and delivering national targets, but the question is, what does this mean in terms of local delivery? and how do you contextualize action at a local level and how do we give people insights? Um, there are some interesting provisions in some of the topic areas of the bill, so for example, local nature recovery strategies, um, but they only deal with a particular part of the environment. The question is whether that should have been expanded and should be part of the governance process overall and give people a real say on how they can help to shape um, priorities for improving um, the environment and natural capital in their local areas. I think there is some important issues around the territorial extent of this bill. Um, so although this is, um, some provisions are UK wide, much of this is England only. Um, there are, there is a section in here for Northern Ireland, particularly on the governance aspects, but there are some differences as well. Um, the Office for Environmental Protection, for example, doesn't have full oversight in terms of um, Scotland um, and Wales. So, you know, there is the, the, the likelihood that we will have a more fragmented approach to environment going forward, um, which doesn't necessarily make sense. Um, it's a personal view. And then the question is the timetable. So although the bill has slipped a little bit um, in its passage, there's a question about the urgency of driving the environmental improvements versus getting, versus getting it right. You know, so is it right that we don't have targets on the face of the bill, but that we actually have a process for setting them? And is that process at the right pace? So I think there's, you know, some questions there. So thank you very much. I will leave it there. That's a quick run through of the key governance provisions. I need to now stop sharing my screen and hand over to Katie. Okay, now I need to do the opposite, share my screen.
There we go. Um, thanks very much, Martin. That was that was um, great uh, set up to what I'm about to talk about. Um, so as Rihanna mentioned, I'm from Client Earth and I work principally on air quality issues um, and trying to uh, get government and other public authorities to comply with the current standards on air quality. So today I'm going to talk about, well, firstly, I'm going to give a very broad and brief explanation of what the bill contains, but um, Martin's already done a, a great job of that, so I will hop skip over that quickly. Um, but then I'm going to talk a little bit more specifically about some of the key provisions in the bill uh, and how they're relevant to air quality in particular, and what the weaknesses are with those provisions and, and how we'd like those weaknesses to be plugged. And hopefully this will provide some food for thought for the panel discussion afterwards. Um, so what does the Environment Bill aim to do? So as Martin mentioned, it's a massive bill. Um, it's over 200 pages and it tries to do rather a lot. Um, and government has kind of described it as comprising of two thematic halves. So the first half provides that high level legal framework for environmental governance. And Martin already kind of uh, explained the key uh, kind of key parts of that governance framework. Um, and then the second half makes provision for more specific kind of nitty gritty policy measures um, uh, relating to resource efficiency, water, nature, biodiversity, uh, but also for, for air quality. And there's a lot in that second half, I'm not gonna touch on it. What I'm gonna talk about now is uh, the bits of the first half of the bill. So this governance framework that I think pose some of the greatest opportunities and, and risks as well for air quality specifically. Um, and, and those are the bits I've underlined there on, on targets and environmental improvement plans. So the bill requires, as Martin said, that the Secretary of State to set new long-term targets for these four individual policy areas. Um, long-term, again, it means an attainment deadline for at least 15 years. Um, long-term targets are required for at least one matter in each of these areas and the bill doesn't set the targets itself uh, themselves but requires draft legislation uh, or regulations to be laid before Parliament um, setting those targets before the 31st of October 2022 and the bill as Martin mentioned also treats air quality as a bit of a special case and requires, in addition to that one long-term target for air quality, another specific target for PM 2.5 concentrations. And importantly, uh, the bill backs this up, backs these targets up with a duty on the sector state to actually ensure that the targets are met. So that's a clear legal obligation of result. And this all sounds pretty good on the face of it. Um, a government that's willing to commit to long-term legally binding goals for air quality. Um, but unfortunately, the devil um, is in the detail on this one, as, as with many things. Um, and as, as it stands, we are quite concerned that these new targets risk being limited in their scope, but also in their ambition. And also, they, they don't have the same kind of legal clout that the existing legal limits for air quality that stem from EU legislation and exist in our current laws do right now. But instead, the, the, the bill kind of leaves the door a little bit ajar for, for government to go backwards. So how? How is that so? Um, so there are kind of three main concerns here for the way that the targets are set and reviewed under the bill. Um, firstly, the bill there's nothing, there's, well, there's very little in there to assure us that these new targets for air quality will represent a step forward from what we already have in law. There, uh, Martin kind of already explained some of the parameters within which these targets have to be set. Um, and there aren't really, there is, isn't really anything there to, that's meaningful with respect to the direction in which those targets have to, be, have to go. They simply have to be capable of being objectively measured. And really concerningly for me as someone working on air quality is that there's no mention at all of human health impacts being considered in the setting or in the reviewing of these long term targets. So I have a major concern as to how, how can we 
be sure that they will aim to do the right thing. Uh, and on top of that, there is no legislative commitment not to row back on what we already have in law. So that means our existing protections uh, for air quality are left exposed to erosion. Uh, and there's, whilst there is commitment to two, but two binding targets for air quality, which you know is 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 comparatively a blessing compared to the other policy areas where only one is required, I still think that this isn't enough to provide a comprehensive framework uh, for improving the air that we breathe, and therefore the UK is at risk of being left behind. Secondly. Um, I'm concerned about the, the role of expert advice and the strength and transparency of that role. So whilst government is required to seek expert advice prior to setting all these targets, there is scope for that advice to be cherry picked and to be ignored. So the source and scope of the advice under the provisions of the bill is, is at the complete discretion of the Secretary of State. There's no explicit requirement to publish that advice. There's no explicit requirement to take in, into account. And where government gets some advice and decides that actually it fancies not following it, there's not even an explanation to a, a requirement to publicly um, explain why it's, it's gone against that advice. Um, and finally, the bill provides that, you know, whilst the Secretary of State has to set targets, once they have been set, there, uh, there's an avenue to weaken them in the future if they're just simply too hard to meet. And, and this is a big shift away from the effect of the supranational targets that the UK was under as part of the EU and provides the government with a lot of new kind of wriggle room uh, with respect to these new targets that it, that it wouldn't have had previously. And whilst, you know, it, some may see this as quite a natural result of Brexit, um, it's still a worrying kind of example of, of things to come. And when you're thinking about the UK failures to comply with legal limits under EU law, I wonder whether the UK would have bothered at all uh, to do anything if, this, uh, if it had this kind of to get out clause. So in a nutshell, this is why we're not completely jumping for joy at the moment at the promise of new targets for air quality just yet. Um, but even if our scepticism is misplaced in this regard and the bill results in, in wonderfully ambitious long-term targets for air quality, um, this risks not meaning a, a huge amount unless there is a robust mechanism to an actually ensure that enough is done to deliver the ambition that's committed to and avoid a kind of too little, too late approach to long-term action. And Martin kind of alluded to those risks before. So what kind of delivery mechanism does the bill provide um, in the hope to avoid this? Well, as, as we've already mentioned, it requires the Secretary of State to prepare what's referred to as an environmental improvement plan, which sets out the steps that government intends to take to improve the natural environment. The Secretary of State then has to report annually on the implementation of this plan to describe what's been done and what progress has been made towards targets. Um, and it then has to review the plan every five years to consider what further steps are needed. And whilst these plans are very hopefully labelled as improvement plans, there are, there are some major problems that we see with the Brill's provisions uh, surrounding them. So firstly, the, the kind of content requirements, the actual legislative the legislation surrounding what has to be in these plans is a very vague and pretty non-existent. Uh, and the principal concern is that there isn't even a requirement for these plans to set out measures to ensure that the targets set by the Secretary of State are actually achieved. Now this seems quite a strange disjoint. <laughs> Surely that's what the plans are there for. But there's no robust uh, and meaningful link between the plans and the limits. Uh, but instead, the EIP, the, the improvement plans, uh, have to be plans for significantly improving the natural environment. And that again leads me on to the second concern, that within that requirement there is no mention of human health. Uh, 
only the natural environment. And, and one could argue that human health is implicit within, within that, but it would be nice um, not to have to argue and for the bill to actually be explicit as to the need to protect human health and following one of the core purposes of these environmental improvement plans. Um, and finally, there's no requirement for public, public bodies to actually deliver or comply with the plan, only to report on a kind of after the event basis on what has been done and what progress has been made. And these emissions are particularly jarring from my point of view as an air quality lawyer, um, because they risk a step backwards for clean air. These kind of environmental improvement plans provide actually much less robust assurances that targets will in fact be delivered than the air quality plans that are required under existing air quality legislation. The existing plans require timetabled, impact assessed measures to ensure that targets are met. And um, nothing with that level of robustness and clarity is included in the bill. So these plans risk being rather more vague policy instruments than providing a clear pathway for action to, to protect people's health. And that's why we're concerned. So with these concerns, what have we actually been doing about this? Um, well, Client Earth has been working with uh, a whole range of other health and environmental uh, NGOs under the banner of the Healthy Air Campaign, and I, and I list some of them out there, um, to push for key changes to the bill, both by speaking directly to government and by pushing for amendments to be tabled at key stages of the bill's progression through Parliament. So what have we been asking for um, as part of this? Well, to kind of lead on to the concerns that I've outlined before, we've really been pushing on three main calls to, to plug these gaps. So firstly, to, to strengthen the rules around how targets are set to ensure that they better protect people's health. Um, and as part of that, we've been pushing for the minimum ambition for the PM 2.5 target to be at least in line with WHO guidelines and with a deadline of 2030. Um, as well as a host of other amendments, but including uh, a more transparent and robust role for expert advice to require that this includes advice on the health impacts of pollution. It's obtained from an independent body. It's published. And if the advice isn't followed, that government at least has to explain why it hasn't done so. Um, secondly, we are pushing to strengthen the rules around how targets are met once they have been set. Um, firstly, by ensuring that these plans are more robust and set a clear path for action uh, so that they set out timetabled measures which ensure that targets are actually likely to be met. So strengthening that link between the targets and the delivery mechanism. Um, but secondly, um, by ensuring that all public bodies play their part in delivering improvements and, and delivering progress towards these targets with a new kind of broad ranging public body duty uh, to act compatibly with those targets uh, and the improvement plans. And this would mean that the, the progress towards these targets becomes more of a pervasive consideration through all relevant decision making. So uh, Martin's already explained this, but progress is stalled partway through the House of Commons committee stage for the same reason why we are all sitting behind screens at the moment. Um, but uh, we have already managed to, to secure quite a significant amount of cross-party support for an amendment to uh, require that P the PM 2.5 target is at least in line with WHO guidelines uh, by 2030. Uh, this was put to a vote uh, in the committee stage uh, and was lost, unfortunately, um, with committee, state, committee members voting down party lines, which perhaps isn't too surprising. But there were some helpful comments from the minister in response, and I set them out there, wh whereby she was stressing that, you know, as a result of pushing these issues, that health will factor into the evidence in which targets are based, even though the bill itself is silent on this point. Um, but also she came back with some unhelpful comments. Um, so pushing back on setting WHO the benchmark, citing kind of technical challenges. Um, and the worry is that the whole point of long-term targets is to set ambition uh, with government and then to decide how that, that is achieved. 
um, and to set a trajectory to action. And it seems that government is, is rather reticent to do that. So what's next? Well, as Martin said, the bill's expected to return quite soon. We don't know yet what the timetables are, but it's important to stress that there are plenty more opportunities for amending the bill going forward as it progresses through the House of Commons and through the House of Lords. So we'll be continuing to, to push these issues um, and provoke comments from, from ministers through this process, um, as, as even these are, are, are legally meaningful. So that's, that's pretty much it from me. I realise we've probably already gone over time, um, but I'm really keen to hear thoughts from the audience as I realise that we've got a lot of people listening who have a lot of expertise. So um, please do uh, comment, ask questions. Um, in the meantime, I'll just leave this link here to the Healthy Air campaign um, briefing, which sets out in a, bit, a little bit more detail what uh, uh, we and our partners are asking for from the bill from an air quality perspective. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martin and Katie. There's a lot of food for thought there. And we have a couple of questions, uh, and I'd invite other questions as well. Just type in the box. You can see Q&A down the bottom. Um, I'll put the first one to Martin because it came in immediately after your talk from Beverly. How confident are you that these targets can be met in the time frame stated? Thanks. Um, very good question. So I should have started my video. Um, so I think you know, there are two things. Firstly, there is a process for setting targets and the question is whether um, those targets can be set within the timescales that have been um, put out by governments. It wouldn't surprise me if um, those dates were amended before the bill completed its passage. Um, so there might be a delay in the end of October 2022 date for actually setting those legally binding targets because of the work that needs to be done to actually get those onto, you know, to, to go through the process of getting the independent advice um, consulting on that, going through scrutiny in select committees and then um, laying the regulations before Parliament. So I think that may be a delay there. And then the question then is, of course, well, what does the target actually require you to achieve by a certain date into the future? And I think um, my sense would be that um, targets will be um, probably quite robust, but achievable. Um, so, you know, I think it really comes down to the extent to which, um, firstly, there's a really good understanding of what has to happen in order to achieve a target. So what's the gap between business as usual and the environmental outcome that we want to achieve that's defined in a target? And then what are the mechanisms that need to be put in place and what's the change that we need to make in the economy and society in places to ensure that that target is met? Um, I think if the analysis is done properly, then we'll know what needs to happen. And if you involve stakeholders in this process of setting that target, then I think there's a good chance, you know, there's, it's more likely than not that those targets will be hit. Okay, thank you. I'll put the next question to Katie. Um, uh, from Janet, so there's no consequence on the Secretary of State if the long-term target is not met. These targets will likely be inherited from previous Secretary of State only a publication of performance will occur. Is that a correct understanding? Um, so there are some consequences and specifically the bill does include some provisions about what, what has to happen when targets are not met. Um, are we concerned that those provisions aren't as strong as what they are in existing air quality legislation? So the sector state has to report on when a target hasn't been met and, and set out steps it intends to take to meet it as soon as is reasonably practicable. And I know that this, this is lawyer speak, but uh, at the moment, the air quality limit values require uh, action to, to, to achieve those targets in the shortest possible time, not just kind of as soon as reasonably practicable. And I'm a bit concerned that as a result, these targets will have less hard hitting consequences. Uh, and the actual kind of detail about what that report has to set out, how the Secretary of State has to then take action, is a little bit more vague. So in terms of accountability, my, my concern is that the bill is, is weaker. Um, and, and like uh, Martin was saying, it's all very well setting those long-term ambitious targets, but we would, you don't want uh, the bill to allow the Secretary of State to just kind of take loads of action the year before and actually realise it's, it's too little too late. 
Um, and that's why like a kind of robust plan making process is really important to actually ensure that, that these targets are delivered on time. And like Martin was saying, this requires like government to actually set out what needs to happen to achieve those targets really clearly, rather than just kind of having a vague policy instrument, which is what the 25 year plan looks like at the moment. Okay, thank you. Um, I don't know who wants to take the next one from Jonathan Foote. Ecosystems tend to have much lower critical levels and loads than the equivalent human health air quality standards. Are we clear where we have potential gaps that would leave human health at greater risk if, if the focus of the environment bill is on ecosystems, which comes to Katie's point, I guess, about human health? Do we have a robust evidence base for all sources of pollutants and future trends? Would anyone like to take that? Yeah, I mean, I think I mean, there are gaps and, um, and there's a significant amount of research that's needed to fully understand um, both, you know, the way in which envi the environment works as, as a system in the UK and the extent to which there is human interaction and the interplay between all of those different elements and therefore where there are vulnerabilities. Um, so. I think, you know, we don't live in a perfect system in terms of our knowledge and there's, a, there's an awful lot more that needs to be done. I think one of the things that we, we proposed um, a, a couple of areas that we felt were really important in the bill that haven't yet come through, um, but we will still be pushing them. So one is some overarching objectives on the bill, um, which do refer to human health and well-being. Um, as being an integral part of the whole part of the bill. So these should be really important considerations. So, you know, we want healthy functioning natural environment. We want an environment that supports health and well-being, and we want to use resources sustainably. You know, that should be the framing of the whole of this bill and, and, and have that clarity. But we also did put um, an amendment down um, relating to specific prescribed criteria that must be considered in setting a particular target. And it's, uh, and they are similar to the target, to, to the criteria that are set in the Climate Change Act actually, but they do include some important um, additional features. One of which is the interconnection and, and, um, and inter, um, so interdependency of different parts of the environment. So that in setting a target in one particular place, in one particular theme, you don't inadvertently um, have negative impacts elsewhere. And I think that's a really important feature is that too much of environmental policy ends up being treating the environment as different silos. And that does um, undermine our ability to understand the environment as a, as a coherent whole. And I think that that's something that really does need a lot of attention. And it's something that we've been pushing into government, particularly about how they're gonna form um, this process for setting the independent advice on what the target should be. Okay, thank you. I'll put the next one to Katie. Is uh, It's from Claire Hawkins or Holman. Is the OEP enforcement procedure too complex and will take too long? Um, yeah, that's a good question. We obviously have, I didn't talk about the OEP at all, um, just didn't really have time. But it's something that we are kind of quite concerned about too. Martin mentioned that, you know, one of the purposes of why it's actually being set up is to kind of fill the shoes of the European Commission and the CJU in terms of enforcement of environmental law. Um, those shoes are reasonably big to fill and obviously Brexit kind of limits the extent that you can do that to some degree. Um, you know, the European Commission and the CJU is a supranational body that regulates governments. The OEP cannot do that. But even so, it's, its powers are kind of, we're worried that its powers are quite limited. Um, it, it, can, it can serve notices on public bodies with respect to their failures to comply with environmental law, but those notices aren't binding and they're also quite limited into what they can do. They can't kind of necessarily undo a decision that um, a, a, a body has already taken. So it's difficult, it would be difficult for the OP to quash decisions. Um, there's a bespoke kind of enforcement mechanism uh, introduced uh, to the OEP called environmental review under the bill, but it's subject to some severe limitations as well. And it's just a basically extension of normal judicial review. And I know that Claire will understand the limitations of that. Um, 
So yeah, not, not a clear answer, but we have real concerns about both the powers of the OOP and also its independence. So the appointments uh, of the non-executive members of the body are by the Secretary of State. And we really need a greater parliamentary oversight of those, of those appointments too, to ensure that it can do its job properly and independently. Thank you. Uh, can um, I just, uh, mm -hmm. come in on that? Because I think, you know, there is a question about, um, you know, at the moment, action from the Commission on member states' failure to implement, you know, environmental law is incredibly slow. I mean, it takes years. There's, there's nothing new about um, public authority, you know, the pace at which public authorities not so much are held to account, but are actually forced uh, to comply with provisions. Um, so, I don't, you know, I think there is, you know, how much, with a body which is much closer to people in the UK, there is a question about whether the utility of that body might be enhanced by its proximity. Um, so I think that that's just a, quite an important uh, rider to place on um, some aspects of the OEP. I mean, ideally what you want is an OEP that doesn't really have to exert on a too frequent basis um, the powers that it has to enforce public authorities' compliance with the law. Um, but actually the fact that it can... I, I agree with that. It's is, is, is quite an important point, I think. But I think it's also worth stressing that whilst the, the kind of infringement proceedings that are available to the Euro European Commission can take a really long time, they are they ultimately result in massive fines. And that's why they take so long, is because they set a path to reaching compliance. And if the member state doesn't at the end of it, there's huge consequence. And we know that the consequence and the threat of those fines does play into, has played into the UK's decision making about whether or not it complies with legal limits. Um, and whilst it might be a lengthy process and it, it is in no way perfect, um, it is quite hard hitting. And the concern is that it's not really being replaced by something equivalent. Um, but I, I take your point of this, the fact that, you know, it itself is definitely not perfect. Thanks. We're coming towards the end. I think, in fact, we've covered the anonymous question. So it would be true to say that coming out of Europe has had a detrimental effect on how we legislate. We've had that discussion just now, I think. That would be fair to say. Um, so we've got a, um, a couple of things together that I'd like to take as the last question that you both may want to address. Uh, Sarah Watkins says, do you think COVID-19 will have a negative, i.e. less fun, e.g. less funding for the environment, or a positive, more public engagement and recognition of environmental benefit, impact on the environment bill moving forwards and Peter asks uh, to what extent do you expect the increased interest in air quality as a result of COVID I think to be translated into public pressure to reinforce legal pressures would you both like to say has the, has COVID been good for the environmental action and the bill or is it just going to be dreadful? There'll be no money. Yeah, well, the money. I mean, the money is interesting. The um, you know the the funds that were announced by Treasury um, at the start of the year, uh, well, in March actually. Um, so, you know, the best part of seven hundred million um, is still there. So we've been in discussions with Treasury officials about how that money can be unlocked to enhance um, improvements in. Uh, natural capital. Um, so, uh, and the discussions that we've had across government is that there's been no diminution of um, either ambition in terms of environment nor um, holding back. And uh, I would also say that that's true from the business groups that we work with. So, um, you know, we work with a lot of the trade bodies and none of them are, are resiling from the, the key challenges that they know we all face from climate change and other environmental pressures. So I don't see that happening. I also don't see people asking for more, um, if I'm honest. So I, don't, I can see that people may want to up the pace on which we implement some of these measures. Um, and I think, you know, just in terms of, you know, COVID, um, it has shone a light on all, all aspects of life and our interactions with society and the environment, which has you know is really important it shows what some people have and what some people don't um, and I think there's you know there's 
you know, that, that's really interesting and, and important. And how we build back, you know, how we use that to build back better is, is the key um, to this. And what's the role of, you know, these long-term targets that are going to be set in setting the trajectory for the, um, you know, for the recovery. And that's certainly, you know, th those are discussions that we've been having across government and um, at the moment they seem to be landing uh, as part of that narrative. Thank you, Katie. Would you like to wind up? Um, yeah, just to, I suppose, put an air quality specific spin on, on that COVID question. I think um, we're definitely seeing an increased interest in air quality and air pollution as a result of this. I mean, this is a, a respiratory illness and there's been studies already released suggesting links between the two. Um, uh, but also people are experiencing cleaner air in their towns and cities obviously not for the right reasons, it's a result of short-term lockdown measures, which we wouldn't want to continue for longer than they have to. But it means that people are talking about it a lot more. I think, well, I think it's difficult to say, obviously, what will happen, but there are risks too. And we're already seeing local authorities stall on action to deliver clean air zones in their towns and cities. And we're just really keen to ensure that, you know, whilst this is a totally unprecedented situation and local authorities are under such pressure, that this doesn't stall on action to, to solve what is, what is a longer term problem. Uh, but then on the flip side, there are lots of local authorities doing great stuff to, to promote cycling and walking within towns and cities. And hopefully this might lead to a shift in people's thinking about how, how they get about. Um, and that will itself have knock on impacts on air, air pollution. Okay. Thank you very much. We're going to wind up now, but I will just Ria Moncton mentions that, of course, this legislation is too late. Uh, it will miss the targets needed to adhere to the climate action by 2030. Or 2030. Do you feel any of this legislation is going to be coming through soon? So it may be too late for climate action is the point about it. 2030. So thank you very much to Katie and to Martin for presenting and for answering your questions. Thank you to everyone that joined online um, for participating and providing interesting discussion points. I must just advertise that on the 22nd of June, we have an indoor air quality online conference from 9.30 to 4.30 with breaks. Um, it's going to cover a range of aspects of indoor air pollution. Uh, you can sign up online, iaqm.co.uk or on the IES website. So please do consider that. Thank you once again to Katie and Martin. Thanks to you and hope to see you online again soon. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.